Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Our service begins on page 80 of the Book of Common Prayer. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. To us a child is born. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. We'll recite the Venite on page 82. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Alleluia, to us a child is born. Come, let us adore him. Alleluia. Our psalms today are Psalm 66 and 67. Psalm 66 is found in the Book of Common Prayer on page 673. Be joyful in God, all you lands. Sing the glory of his name. Sing the glory of his praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great strength, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down before you, sings to you, sings out your name. Come now and see the works of God, how wonderful he is in his doing toward all people. He turned the sea into dry land so that they went through the water on foot. And there we rejoiced in him. In his might, he rules forever. His eyes keep watch over the nations. Let no rebel rise up against him. Bless our God, you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who holds our souls in life and will not allow our feet to slip. For you, O oh God, have proved us. You have tried us just as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water but you brought us out into a place of refreshment. I will enter your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows, which I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you sacrifices of fat beasts with the smoke of rams. I will give you oxen and goats Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I called out to him with my mouth, and his praise was on my tongue. If I had found evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his love from me. 
Psalm 67 starts on 675. May God be merciful to us and bless us. Show us the light of his countenance and come to us. Let your ways be known upon earth. Your saving help among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide all the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth her increase. May God, our own God, give us his blessing. May God give us his blessing. And may all the ends of the earth stand in awe of him. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Sirach. Those who honor their father atone for sins, and those who respect their mother are like those who lay up treasure. Those who honor their father will have joy in their own children, and when they pray, they will be heard. Those who respect their father will have long life, and those who honor their mother obey the Lord. They will serve their parents as their masters. Honor your father by word and deed, that, this, that his blessing may come upon you. For a father's blessing strengthens the houses of the children, but a mother's curse uproots their foundations. For kindness to a father will not be forgotten and will be credited to you against your sins. In the day of your distress, it will be remembered in your favor. Like frost in fair weather, your sins will melt away. Whoever forsakes a father is like a blasphemer, and whoever angers a mother is cursed by the Lord. My child, perform your tasks with humility, and then you will be loved by those whom God accepts. Here ends the reading. We will recite together Canticle 9 on page 86. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid. For the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior. Therefore you shall draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. And on that day you shall say, Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make his deeds known among the peoples. See that they remember that his name is exalted. Sing the praises of the Lord, for he has done great things. And this is known in all the world. Cry aloud, inhabitants of Zion. Ring out your joy. For the Great One in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the book of 1 John. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Do not, <clears throat> do not love the world or the things in the world. 
The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away. But those who do the will of God live forever. Here ends the reading. We're going to recite together Canticle 12, a song of creation. And since it's lengthy, we're going to narrow it down to three parts. We're going to recite the invocation, and then part three, the people of God, and then the end, which is called the doxology. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. And part three, let the people of God glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O priests and servants of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O spirits and souls of the righteous. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. You that are holy and humble of heart, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the doxology. Let us glorify the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. A reading from the Gospel, Gospel of John. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. In seminary, we had to write a long research paper on one of the letters in the New Testament. So I decided I wanted to write a paper on Paul's letter to the Romans, specifically the section in chapter 1 that seems to condemn homosexuality. The author says that it's because of human sinfulness that God gave over human beings to shameful lust, just quoting it directly. And then it goes on to say that women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones and that men became inflamed with lust for one another. I wanted to do a paper on this section because of how frequently it has been lobbed against the gay community to demonize them, and about how frequently it has been used to suppress the rights of LGBT plus people in general. And it breaks my heart that the Bible is used in such a way. But I had also read about a really fascinating argument that one modern theologian has made. His name is Douglas Campbell. Campbell has argued that these words they're not actually St. Paul's. Now, to be clear, yeah, St. Paul is saying them or writing them, but they're not his teaching. They don't originate with him. Rather, according to Campbell, Paul is quoting somebody he is arguing against. He's quoting an adversary. And Campbell came onto this idea by actually reading this section and realizing how choppy it is. It just, pieces just don't fit together the way that they should if it was just a monologue. And I mean, if you take the time to actually read, like Romans chapter one through chapters one through three, you'll see that it's actually kind of hard to follow the line of thought. But once Campbell started to entertain the idea that this section could be a dialogue or a debate instead of a monologue, where Paul could be quoting a line of thought that he's seeking to refute, well, things seem to flow much more smoothly. 
and Campbell's take on things, it really fascinated me, and I eagerly set out to write the paper on it. And the more I dove in, the more convinced I became. And after my uh, New Testament professor had graded my paper, he called me into his office for a meeting with him. Uh-oh. <laughs> I nervously sat down across the table from him, but he had this huge smile beaming across his face, so that gave me some hope at least that maybe things were going to be okay. And he said, TJ, your paper is really, really incredible. You have a real gift for specifying your argument and for arguing it all the way through until the very end, he said. And I responded with something kind of snarky, uh, something like, gee, you really have a way of making a seminarian blush. <laughs> but then he responded with, wait, I'm not finished yet. Well, crap. <laughs> Here we go, you know. <laughs> and he continued and he said, your paper is really, really good. It's just too bad how wrong you are. <laughs> now, to be fair, he did give me an A+, plus, but he said it wasn't because I was right, it was because I had made a good argument. <laughs> After having come to terms with this backhanded compliment, the two of us sat there for about half an hour, talking about the details of my research and talking about his take on this section of, of Romans. Have you ever entertained the thought that Paul could have been wrong? He asked me. Having come out of a more conservative Christian tradition that tends to take the Bible literally and tends to see the Bible as being flawless, I didn't know that was even an option. <laughs> the thought itself felt very scandalous, very heretical to me at the time, but I'll admit it felt very freeing. In my professor's mind, those words that seem to condemn homosexuality, they are indeed Paul's words. However, he strongly questioned whether or not Paul would have written those words and held to that viewpoint at the end of his life. Now, of course, like there's no way of knowing for sure, but my professor believed that Paul probably would have taken that line of thought back as he got older and wiser and got deeper into the heart of God. It's my sincere hope as well that that would have been the case. I mean, after all, if you take the time to read Paul's letters, Paul becomes gradually more progressive as time goes on. We in the Episcopal tradition will openly admit that the Bible can be wrong in some places. We openly admit that the Bible is outdated and misogynistic and homophobic and many other things. While other traditions hold that the Bible is the inerrant or the infallible perfect word of God, does this make our view shallow or hopeless or uninspired? I don't think so. Actually, not in the slightest. In fact, to say that the Bible is infallibly perfect, it actually creates more problems than it solves. The Bible is riddled with contradictions and with things that are not so great. <laughs> you know, let's call it for what it is. I mean, is God a loving God or is God a genocidal God? Can a God who orders the extinction of entire people groups in the Old Testament be a loving God? And what about those psalms where the poet begs God to smite his enemies? Where the poet asks God to bash the skulls of his enemies' children against the rocks? Should we pray in this way as well? Is that God's infallible word to us? And what about that whole bit in the New Testament where we're told by Jesus to love our enemies? Can you really love your enemies while you're praying for their demise and their children's demise? And if the early church believed that the scriptures were infallible, flawless, without error, why did the gospel writers not only supplement but choose to change the stories around Jesus' life? I mean, it's widely accepted that Matthew and Luke used Mark's gospel as a template for their own Gospels. But if they believed Mark's version to be infallible and without error, why did Matthew and Luke change what Mark wrote in so many places? The stories contradict each other in all kinds of places. We Episcopalians, we hold to a view that God didn't override the human element whenever the Bible was composed 
by human hands. It was written by human beings, and because it was written by human beings, we see both vice and virtue in it. Human perfection and human brokenness. And rather than throwing out those parts of the Bible that are archaic and aren't very politically correct in our minds, in our tradition we choose to keep them and to learn from them. We have to be wise as we engage with them, but we, there is still something to be learned from them. For example, like most of us know that it's not a terribly saintly thing or holy thing if we were to pray that God would destroy our enemies. And yet, we know what it feels like to want to pray in such a way at certain times, right? So while we read those parts of the Psalms, for example, where the poet is praying that God would smite and damn his enemies, we know well enough that we shouldn't imitate his prayers because we know it's wiser to follow Jesus' way of love instead of the psalmist's prayers of hatred. But there's still a lesson to be learned in reading them. Those psalms, they teach us that God still listens to our prayers and that we should still pray not only when we're at our very best, but also when we're at our very worst. The psalms teach us that we should bring our whole selves to God and not just our neat and tidy churchy selves. We should bring our broken selves to God, our angry selves to God, our hateful selves and our doubtful selves to God. The Bible as a whole, it teaches us this lesson, especially whenever we allow ourselves to see the human defects in it. It's actually quite a beautiful vision. We Episcopalians, we believe that there is something in the Bible that is uh, sufficient for salvation. That's the nerdy doctrinal way of putting it. In other words, what this means is that we love the Bible enough to critique it. And yet, even with all its flaws and its contradictions, we still know that the Bible is as good as it gets whenever it comes to a meeting place with the divine. And we don't need the Bible to be perfect or infallible or inerrant or whatever word you want to fill in the blank with, because we have learned that God chooses to speak to us through all sorts of imperfect and flawed situations and people. You are listening to one of them right now, right? And I'm saying this today because... I know that many of you got yourselves hung up on John's words in the second reading this morning about how we're not to love the world or anything in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world, John says. And I've seen all sorts of mental gymnastics done around this text, all sorts of teachers and preachers who try to explain away and to rationalize John's line of thought here. Well, the word is the world is just a code word for the empire or for evil leaders or for sinful people, some have said. But it's pretty clear that when John says the world, the cosmos, what he means is the world, everything. So are you telling us, John, that we are not to love our country? or our city, or our neighbors, or our loved ones, or all of the little things that make daily life so sweet and so meaningful? And are we to do what John says at the end of the reading and hate the things that bring us bodily pleasure and hate the things that look beautiful to the eyes and hate even the very thought of having money? Rather than trying to justify and legitimize John's words here, what if we entertain the possibility that he was perhaps just plain wrong? Would this mean that this passage has nothing worthwhile to teach us? Not at all. Not at all. I mean, most of us can feel that John's teaching is off, even if we're unable to name the reason why. I mean, John is pitting God and the world against each other. Didn't somebody once say that God loved the world? Perhaps they said it several times, you know. But John is pitting God against the world as if there's some kind of struggle or battle between the two. And on a personal note, the thing is, is that like, it's precisely in and through the world that we have encountered God. For many of us, the line between the world and God, it's not so pronounced. John is thinking dualistically. And the fact that we can see this, we react to this as we read him, on some level at least, it teaches us that we have overcome dualistic thinking. 
And in reacting against John's words here, we can sense on some level at least that we have learned how to see the world as a sacrament for the divine. And that if we were to reject the world, we would also be rejecting the very place where we encounter the divine. And in feeling that John is wrong, on some level at least, we can sense that our eyes have been opened and our minds have been enlightened. At least a little bit, right? Had we not had John's words here to react against, perhaps we would have never learned this lesson about ourselves. In my opinion, there's far more to be gained if we see John's line of thought as being wrong, as opposed to seeing his line of thought as being completely in the right. Now the question is, was this John's intention all along? The question is, was he just plain wrong in what he wrote, or did he want you to believe that he was just plain wrong in what he wrote? Did he just have a very shallow spirituality and worldview when he wrote this letter? Or did he know that sometimes people learn the best whenever teachers play the devil's advocate and give their students something to push back against? The most important question of all, though, is this. What would it matter if one turned out to be more true than the other? If at the end of the day, you become more deeply awakened and aware of awakened to and aware of God's presence in our world. Continue now with the Apostles' Creed on page 96. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We'll pray suffrages A. Show us your mercy, O Lord. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, 
Grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom, defend us, your humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth, and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. God from God, light from light eternal, lo, he abhors not the virgin's womb. service concludes with a prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.